Hey everybody, time for the second video on bone tissue. So what we're going to start out with today is just remembering that bone is connective tissue, okay? So say that, bone is connective tissue. Remind yourself of that. And connective tissue does not have a ton of cells. I mean, if I take a look at this bone slide right here, I see these osteocytes. I see all these osteocytes. And of course, what are they sitting in? They're sitting in their little lacuni. So those are all the osteocytes. But they are rather far apart. There is all of this space in between them. There's all this pinkish space. Now, and by the way, this slide of bones is a different um, technique used to prepare the bone than the ones we looked at in lab. So if you're wondering why it looks so pink, that's why. But look at all that pinkness in between the bone cells. That pinkness is bone matrix. Remember, connective tissues are usually dominated by the matrix. Okay? So, in that bone matrix, we're going to talk about what it's actually composed of. One third of it is this stuff called osteoid. And I'm sorry, my arrow is covering up part of that word. It's O-S-T-E-O-I-D, osteoid. So a third of the bone matrix is this stuff called osteoid, which is primarily collagen and this liquid called ground substance. The collagen is what gives it the pinkishness in here. The pinkishness. Now, Collagen, of course, is going to give some flexibility, but allow that bone to resist tension, allow it to resist pulling forces. Now, the other two-thirds of that bone matrix, so one-third is osteoid, we got two-thirds left over. The other two-thirds is this stuff called hydroxyapatite. This is the mineral portion of bone matrix. And it's made up of calcium phosphate, CaPO4, and calcium hydroxide, CaOH2. Remember, we said that bone had a function in storing minerals. And two of the minerals stored in bone are calcium and phosphorus. But it's not just the storage thing that's going on here. By having this mineralized matrix, it makes the matrix really hard. Hardness is good for protection. Think about the hardness of your skull, perhaps. Hardness also resists compression. So if you stand up right now, you are putting weight on your femurs, your thigh bones, your tibias, your shin bones. You are compressing them. And the hardness because of the mineralization of the matrix, is going to resist that. Okay, so that is our intro to bone matrix. A good analogy is right here in front of us. So we've got some concrete here, and we've got some iron rebar here. We're gonna, when this concrete sets, it's gonna have a combination of ability to resist compression, resist tension. It is going to be very hard and strong. This is a lot like the way your bone is made. All right. Check this bone out right here. This is a human fibula. What has happened to this human fibula? Has it A been demineralized, or B, has its collagen been removed? So A, it's been demineralized, or B, it's been, had its collagen removed. What let somebody turn this fibula, which is a pretty long bone, it runs basically from the outside of your knee to the outside of your ankle, so that's pretty long. I mean, I just measured it on myself. And what happened to this bone? What let it be so bendable? Okay, the answer is A. It has been demineralized. The answer is A. And you can actually do this experiment at home. All you need are two ingredients. You need some vinegar 
and you need a, a bone, like a chicken drumstick bone works perfectly. So some vinegar and a chicken drumstick bone. So you take a glass, a, it doesn't have to be like a, a jar like this, but take any glass Tupperware, whatever, something that has a lid, put some vinegar in it, stick that chicken bone in there, after you've eaten all the delicious chicken off of it, of course. Seal it and let it sit in your kitchen for a couple days. Then take it out and see how bendy that bone is. All right, if you do this, you're sending me a picture of it. It is another extra credit experiment for you to do at home. Um, kind of an involved one, but hey, why not? Do it. Get some, get some extra credit, right? Absolutely. All right. Let's talk about the arrangement of that matrix, the arrangement of the osteocytes in our long bones. And we've hit this in the lab, so we are reviewing it right now. Let's say that we had a femur. I'm going to draw a cr kind of crappy looking femur here. Dun, dun, dun. Kind of a crappy looking femur. It's an ugly femur, I know. But the femur is a long bone, and I'm going to mark off its diaphysis. In the diaphysis, the long bone has a microscopic structure in which it's arranged, running along the direction of this diaphysis. We are going to have the cylinders called osteons. So we're going to have cylinders running this way, so many of them going vertically in our femur here, in this long, direct, long axis of it. We're going to have these cylinders of bone matrix called osteons. An osteon is going to have this central canal with blood vessels and nerves in it, then surrounded by multiple concentric layers of matrix. These are called concentric lamellae. They're concentric because they share the same center. They're layers of bone matrix. Then embedded in between those concentric layers, we have these beautiful little guys right here. Who knows what these are? Shout it out if you know. These are osteocytes. And what's the space the osteocytes are sitting in? They're sitting in lacunae. Exactly. So this is the basic structure of the diaphysis, diaphysis of our long bone. We have these cylinders, and we see a beautiful one down here. This is a beautiful cylinder that would be found in the diaphysis of a long bone. Such a cylinder is called an osteon. It has a central canal in the center. That central canal will typically have a nerve, a vein, an artery, VAN. There's a van driving through your central canal. There's some endosteum lining that central canal, by the way, that I'm clicking dots on here. And then we got our concentric lamellae, the layers of bone matrix forming rings around that central canal. And then within, in between the layers of matrix within the matrix itself, we have osteocytes. And osteocytes are, are surmounting a problem. So osteocytes are surrounded by matrix. Bone matrix is incredibly hard. It's challenging, not challenging, it's gosh darn impossible for nutrients to diffuse through bone matrix. Luckily, there are all these little passageways, all these little passageways here called canaliculi, and the osteocytes stick their arms and legs through them, and they touch one another, and they exchange nutrients and wastes and information. So we see some beautiful lacunae for osteocytes in this particular slide on the bottom left here. We see a central canal. This whole big thing is an osteon, which is one of the cylindrical structures that makes up the shaft the diaphysis, in other words, of a long bone. 
All right, magnificent. Okay, we're looking on the right-hand side here at the compact bone in the diaphysis of a long bone. So what are we going to see? What are we going to see there? If you said osteons, you are correct. Here's an osteon up here. Here's a beautiful osteon right here. Here's another osteon right here. Fantastic osteons. And remember, we saw these in lab. Okay, quick extra credit question here. Send me an email. Tell me what all the things in here are. What's A, what's D, and what's C? I don't know why there's no B in this picture. So you, you only get to do three things. What's A, what's D, what's C? Shoot me an email for a little bit more extra credit. If you ever feel like I'm giving you too much extra credit, let me know. Send me an email. If you ever feel like there's not enough vocabulary words, shoot me an email and say, hey, Professor Moltz, there's not enough vocab. Give, give us some more. And I will oblige. All right. I couldn't resist doing one more. What I want you to do right now is pause your screen. Pause your screen. Yeah, pause your screen. Pause this video and point out your central canal, your concentric lamellae, your osteos, uh, your lacunae, and your canaliculis. Do that for me. Okay. And here we see another kind of like more big picture view. And we were looking at the little picture view. But here is a femur up here. Nice drawing of a femur. Here is the diaphysis from here to here. And here is the compact bone of that diaphysis. This is the same stuff we're seeing right here. This is compact bone. And in that compact bone, what do we have? We have osteons. There's one. There are a bunch right there. Look at those central canals, beautiful central canals. We see concentric lamellae. We see lacunae with osteocytes. We even see some little canaliculi in there as well. Fantastic. And check out the spongy bone on the interior of the marrow cavity there. And look at how long the central canals are. The central canals, they're as long as the diaphysis. But there is still that mystery to be solved of how the blood vessels get in there. And the blood vessels get into the central canal because of perforating canals. Okay? I wish the picture showed me one, but it would be awesome if we could see a perforating canal like right here. Perforating canals run transversely. So blood vessels could use this perforating canal that is made up to get into the central canal. Here's a perforating canal down here connecting two centrals. Here's a perforating canal connecting a central canal to the marrow cavity. All right, beautiful. Let's keep on going. I couldn't resist showing you one more. I'm going histology crazy here. Look at all these osteons. You should be able to recognize central canals. You should be able to recognize concentric lamellae, etc. Okay, let's keep going. Flat bones. We're moving to flat bones. Flat bone structure. We hit this in lab. We're hitting it here as well. When we look at a flat bone... Like the what? What bone are we zooming in on right here? What is this bone that we're zooming in on right here? Quickly, do you got it? I'll give you all the vowels if you're thinking about it. I'll give you all the vowels. There you go. You got it now? I'll throw in some consonants. That was P-A-R-I-E-T-A-L. It's the parietal bone. And when we zoom in on it, we see the typical flat bone structure which consists of a sandwich-style arrangement with the bread made out of compact bone. I put some black dots on the compact bone right there. Then the interior, the meat and the cheese, and the other fixins in the sandwich made out of spongy bone. And we zoom in on that spongy bone, and we see the trabeculi, and we see the spaces as well. Now, what is that space for? That space is for bone marrow. And 
what kind of marrow do we have here? The marrow we have here is going to be red bone marrow. And this over here is actually red bone marrow. All this stuff in here is red bone marrow. Here's some compact bone up here. I'm just going to try to make a B. CB, that does not look like CB, I know. I know. All right. What's red bone marrow's function? Red bone marrow's function is that long word. Remember it? Hematopoiesis. And last but not least, for, lest I forget, the spongy bone in that flat bone sandwich is known as the diploa. All right. So let's keep on going. Let's talk about how bones grow. Okay. We do not have an adult bone here. We have a, a bone of a child or an adolescent. So we have a long bone of a child here, okay? And let's kind of point out a few things. This is our diaphysis down here. This is our epiphysis right here. We see some compact bone on the outside of both. We see some spongy bone on the inside of both. We've got some articular cartilage on the outside of the epiphysis. And of course, that articular cartilage is hyaline cartilage. That's why they colored it blue here. It's pretty typical to color hyaline cartilage blue. But notice there is also this plate of hyaline cartilage right here. And this plate of hyaline cartilage right there is called the epiphyseal plate. The epiphyseal plate. Epiphyseal plate. It's your growth plate. Now, what is going to happen in this epiphyseal plate, okay? What is going to happen is that new cartilage is formed on this side, on the side closest to the epiphysis. We grow new cartilage that pushes the epiphysis upward, that makes the bone get longer. And by the way, the op the on the opposite side of this, the same thing is happening, just it's in the other direction, right? So the bone is getting longer because we're growing new cartilage. But then, on the other side, on this other side, let's switch colors here, on this other side of the epiphyseal plate, the cartilage there is turning into bone. So that way... It's not like we're growing in length, but the bone is turning into cartilage. We're growing in length, and the bone still is primarily made of bone. We added some new cartilage to get the bone longer. Then we replaced some cartilage with bone so that we're not, we don't have a, a bone made out of cartilage that would be too, too floppy and too flexible. All right, so on the epiphysis side... The epiphyseal plate grows new cartilage. On the diaphysis side, the epiphyseal plate turns it turns cartilage into bone. And that is how the bone grows longer. And that type of growth is called interstitial growth. If we look at an epiphyseal plate, if we look at an epiphyseal plate, we actually divide the cartilage in there into different zones. On the side of it closest to the epiphysis, closest to the end of the bone, we have what's called the proliferation zone. That's where the cartilage cells are growing. That's why it says they're undergoing mitosis, because the cartilage cells are growing. And that makes the bone grow longer. As we get on the other side, we are going to have the area where the cartilage turns into bone. And what happens is the cartilage cells get bigger. Then they, their matrix around them calcifies. The cartilage cells die. And then new bone starts to get formed. Osteoblasts start forming new bone matrix. I'm not going to have you remember these names. Hypertrophic zone, calcification zone, ossification zone. But you should have a general idea of what's going on here. On the epiphysis side, 
the cartilage cells grow, they divide, they make new ones by mitosis, okay? That makes the bone longer. But then on the other side of the epiphyseal plate, we are going to have cartilage cells get bigger and die than bone-making cells. Osteoblasts are going to migrate in and make bone matrix. So we're making new bone, and we're making the entire bone, the entire long bone, get longer. All right. Here we see a slide of a child's bone. Always kind of upsetting when you think about that, that this is a slide of a, of a kid's bone, right? So up here is the epiphysis. Down here is the diaphysis. This thing right here is the epiphyseal plate. So my question for you is, what's going on on this side of the epiphyseal plate? What's the cartilage there doing? If you said growing, you're correct. If you said dividing, you're correct. Mitosis, you're correct. Yeah, we're making new cartilage. And that cartilage is pushing upward, which is going to make this bone get longer. But then what's happening right here? That's where cartilage is going to turn into bone. Because we don't want to just build more and more cartilage, right? We want to get the bone longer, and we want it to be longer but still made of bone. And notice, by the way, as growth occurs, because we're making cartilage on one end as we take it away on the other, so we're making cartilage here, we're taking away from it here, the epiphyseal plate sticks around. And the bone growth keeps going as the kid grows and grows and grows. All right. Fantastic. Let's bring hormones into the mix. I know you're wondering, you're like, well, what causes the epiphyseal plate to do this? In childhood, the main thing that's doing this is this hormone called growth hormone. And growth hormone comes from the pituitary gland. Oh, I didn't mean to have an arrow there. Let's get rid of that. I guess I could have an arrow. There's the pituitary gland right there. Hey, by the way, what bone is the pituitary gland sitting in? What saddle-shaped depression? If you've done the lab video, you should have heard this. It's the cella tersica of the sphenoid bone. But anyhow, the pituitary gland makes growth hormone. Growth hormone stimulates the activity of the epiphyseal plate. It causes both events to occur. Cartilage grows on the epiphyseal side, and cartilage is converted into bone on the diaphyseal side. Diaphysis gets longer, and the epiphyseal plate hangs out so we can keep on growing. Fan. Fantastic. Hey, what if you don't have enough growth hormone or if you have way too much? Can you figure out who had not enough growth hormone here? Was it Yorgi Murison or Vern Troyer? It was Vern Troyer. He did not have enough growth hormone. He, is what is, he is, has pituitary dwarfism. Um, Jorgen Murison, George Murison, right here, played in the NBA a long time ago. He was, he had way too much growth hormone from his pituitary gland. I think uh, George here was 7 foot 7 inches tall, and I don't think Vern was even 2 feet tall. All right. Good stuff. Let's talk about some other hormones that impact bone growth. And that's the sex hormones. Estrogen is the dominant sex hormone for females, testosterone for males. Um, estrogen, of course, comes from the ovary, testosterone from the testes, and these hormones really start getting produced around what period of life? Puberty. Now, both these hormones stimulate the activity of the epiphyseal plate. And both of them are going to act more on one side than the other. Both of them cause 
fast conversion of cartilage to bone, remember that's on the diaphysis side, and a slower production of new cartilage. So there is a, a lot of growth because of these hormones. But as the bone grows in length, the epiphyseal plate gets narrower and narrower until ultimately it disappears. And then there's no more epiphyseal plate. There's just a remnant of bone called the epiphyseal line, which we met in the last video. So, sex hormones have a dramatic effect on the epiphyseal plates. They cause the bone to get longer, but they also cause the epiphyseal plates to get narrower and narrower and eventually to disappear. Now, which of these two hormones do you think has the more powerful effect on the epiphyseal plate? If you guessed estrogen, you are absolutely correct. Think about it, too. Who tends to get taller first, boys or girls? When, they, when they're both, you know, who tends to have that growth spurt and get taller first? It's definitely girls most of the time. Estrogen has a more powerful effect on the epiphyseal plate. So the girls are going to start growing really quickly. But then they're going to stop. Why did the girl stop growing? What happened to that plate? It disappeared. It turned into bone. Now, testosterone doesn't have as powerful as an effect. So the boys aren't going to shoot up and get as, as tall as quickly. But they're going to get taller over a longer period of time. And the epiphyseal plate is going to persist for a longer period of time and the boys are going to generally be taller. Okay, good stuff. Excellent. There's another kind of growth called appositional growth. This is where we remodel it. Maybe we grow in width. Maybe we add a little bit to one part of the bone. We take a little bit more, take a little away somewhere else. Um, this is due to the bones dealing with stress. So when you stress bones, osteocytes measure that stress, and osteocytes communicate with osteoblasts and osteoclasts, telling them to build new bone in certain places and remove bone in other places in order to better deal with the stress. And two examples of when this occurs, if you have braces, I bet at least one person in this class is rocking some braces right now. If you have braces, braces are going to change the structure of your jaw bones. Because you are putting stress on those teeth and that transmit that stress to the bone and it remodels and your teeth get straighter. Magic. Um, also, lifting weights. Lifting weights, fantastic thing to do. Hopefully you exercise, lift some weights, do some stuff like that. Lifting weight stresses your bone. By the way, building strong bones is important for, it's important for men and women, right? Absolutely important for men and women. But it's really important for women. It is really important for women. And we want strong bones but strong bones in women is a must. Why is this? Well, let's talk about this for a second. Women eventually are going to go through menopause. And this is where the ovaries stop responding to the hormones that normally stimulate them. And when the ovaries stop responding to their normal stimulating hormones, the ovaries make less estrogen. So estrogen levels are going to start to decrease. Now, one of the things estrogen does, estrogen normally estrogen normally inhibits osteoclasts. So estrogen normally inhibits osteoclasts. What, what, 
what was the job of osteoclasts? They were the bone breakers. They broke down bone matrix. So if estrogen is inhibiting osteoclasts, well, the bone matrix sticks around, right? But as estrogen activity, estrogen levels go down, osteoclast activity goes up increase osteoclast activity. And as there's increased osteoclast activity, there's going to be a breakdown of bone matrix. And does anybody know what I'm describing here? What bone weakening situation I'm describing here? This is called osteoporosis. So it is important to build strong bones if you are a female, no matter how old you are. Get that exercise, build those strong bones. Now, guys, that doesn't mean you get a pass here. You should be exercising and building strong bones, too. All right. Let's keep on going. There's a pair of terms we got to know. Osteolysis and osteogenesis. Osteolysis is the breakdown of bone. If you are in space, this is one of my favorite astronauts right here. This dude, Commander Chris Hadfield. Feel free to let me know who your favorite astronaut is. Um, hopefully you have one. If you are in space, you are going to not be not be experiencing the normal effect of gravity like you would on the surface of the earth and your muscles when you're on earth your muscles are always battling gravity you are always battling gravity when you stop doing that battle because you're in space your muscles are not pulling on bone as much and bone matrix will start breaking down osteoclast activity will increase because your osteocytes, they measure the drop in stress, and they're like, well, okay. We don't need all this bone matrix. Let's be energy efficient here. Let's break some of it down. Um, yeah, so don't do this. Don't, don't not stress your bones. I feel like there's some really bad English right there, but hopefully you understood what I was trying to say. Now, there's also the building of bone tissue. That's osteogenesis. Genesis creation, osteobone. This lady right here, she is strong. She is doing a dumbbell hang clean with a good solid amount of weight right there. If you are lifting weights, you are stressing bone. You are going to build new bone matrix. You are going to increase your osteoblast activity and do some osteo Genesis. All right. Guys, we're almost done. We have just a few more topics to do. Now, whether we're doing osteogenesis or osteolysis, that depends on other things besides stress. It also depends on blood calcium levels. And by the way, notice I threw some new terms up here. Osteogenesis is bone deposition. So you're making, you're depositing new matrix. Osteolysis is bone resorption. You're resorbing, uh, breaking down bone matrix. And which one of these things you're doing depends on blood calcium levels. Let's run through an example here. If blood calcium levels drop, and by the way, you got to maintain blood calcium homeostasis, right? You need proper calcium levels for muscle contraction, so both skeletal muscles, pulling on your bones, as well as the, as well as the cardiac muscle of your heart, smooth muscle of your tubes. You also need calcium for nerve signaling, for blood clotting. If your blood calcium goes awry, you can die. So if blood calcium drops, we got to bring it back up. What do we call that? When we start with a stimulus going one way and our response is to take it the other way. That is good old negative feedback. So 
if blood calcium levels drop, that is measured by these glands right here in the back of your thyroid gland, which is in the so sort of like on the posterior aspect of the trachea. You have these four parathyroid glands. And the parathyroid glands, they measure your blood calcium, they compare it to normal, and then if it's below normal, they release this hormone called parathyroid hormone, or PTH for short. PTH will do three things to raise your blood calcium. It'll increase your osteoclast activity. That will break down matrix. That, of course, is bone resorption. And if you break down matrix, calcium spills into the blood. And calcium blood levels of calcium rises. Also, the PTH doesn't just mess with the, the bone bank of calcium. It also acts on your intestines, making you absorb more calcium from your food. And it acts on your kidneys, making you pee away less calcium. And so the, the combination of this trio of effects is to raise your blood calcium levels. All right. Well, what about the opposite? What if blood calcium levels are too high? Well, then it's actually your thyroid gland that's the one doing the job here. Your thyroid gland, this butterfly on the anterior side of your trachea here, just beneath your voice box, your larynx, your thyroid gland has these cells called C cells. C cells. Um, I want to turn it into a tongue twister, but I'm going to refrain because we've got to finish this video. C cells measure that drop in blood calcium, oh, sorry, that rise in blood calcium, and release a hormone called calcitonin. So blood calcium went up. Calcitonin has got to tone it down, has got to drop blood calcium. It does it in two ways. It inhibits your osteoclasts. So that's going to decrease your breakdown of bone matrix and keep calcium in your, in your bone bank. It also makes you pee away more calcium. And that's going to decrease the calcium levels in your blood. So two ways we achieve calcium homeostasis here. And both of them have an effect on your bone matrix. Okay, wonderful. Now, we've talked about a lot of things necessary and important for bone. There are two vitamins that are essential for bone matrix. One of them is found in delicious fruits, delicious citrus fruits. I'm hungry right now, so I would eat all of these. And these guys are rich in vitamin C. Here's vitamin C right here. Vitamin C is necessary for collagen synthesis. And without enough collagen, your bones are going to get weaker and weaker. So don't get scurvy. The disease where you're lacking vitamin C. Don't get that. It'll weaken your bones. Also, here's a nice sunset. The UV radiation in sunlight is going to help us make what vitamin? Vitamin D. So we have vitamin C up here, vitamin D down here. And vitamin D is necessary for proper blood calcium levels, which is necessary for proper bone growth and bone maintenance and bone remodeling. All important things. And with that, my friends, we are done with the bone tissue lectures. Video number two is done in a quick 39 minutes. Time flies when you're having fun. And I will see you next time. Bye-bye.